So, welcome to another lecture. Um, the topic today is actually what else should it be about disciplines? And in academia, we always deal with disciplines, with uh, subject areas that we think about. And there is this thing with this terminology, the disciplines has as well this kind of disciplining uh, character. Of course, first and, first and foremost, it is about bordering. Uh, drawing borders and, and limiting the area we are looking at, looking at uh, uh, in, within these borders at certain orders and finding a way of ordering uh, issues, uh, looking for certain laws, looking for certain regularities and uh, contexts, meaning we have these borders, we have these areas, limited. At the same time, we are looking at something uh, that defines it actually from outside. What is this discipline is not, and then we have another discipline. What is economics is not sociology. What is sociology is not biology or psychology. So sometimes we may have something completely different uh, sociology and biology, and sometimes we have something where we say, well, actually, it's it's not always entirely clear uh, if it is sociology or psychology. And then we have as well bridging uh, disciplines like social psychology or something like this. Um, in any case, what it is about, uh, we can refer to Niklas Luhmann, uh, it is this a reduction of complexity. We have a huge uh, field where we don't have any criteria, where we don't have uh, anything that we can uh, refer to, and this reference we establish by disciplines. But, and there's always a but, uh, but we can actually only understand what we already know. Uh, to reach something that is entirely new is extremely difficult because we are always bound to an existing knowledge. We can take a very simple thing, we are always bound to language, um, to certain language, and only from there we can start moving on. We are always thinking in language, um, we, we cannot think um, in abstract terms without such a category. Now it may be that we are playing with language, that we are inventing new words, but it's new words, meaning we have to have already this criterion of a word, of a term. And uh, there is a huge debate, a long-lasting deba debate, uh, on this. Um, Isaiah Berlin was talking about these inner laws uh, inherent to the objective, uh, to, to the object uh, itself. He did so in his uh, analysis of uh, Giambattista Vico, and uh, there is, of course, then this. Uh, major work by Thomas Kuhn, um, who limited basically uh, these areas and, and said, we have two ways, we have certain paradigms, we are getting deeper and deeper into things, uh, and in a way we are reproducing the knowledge we already have. We are using the same paradigm, we are going on and uh, proving what we already know, um, having different uh, methodologies as well, uh, coming from different approaches and confirming this existing knowledge. And then he says we have paradigm shifts where we have a fundamental break. Um, it's not about continuing what we have already, but to think about something 
that is um, that is new, as simple as that. How to reach there? And there is a paradox if we talk about um, what we are doing here from about science, about uh, how to proceed, or what what are the fundamentals of a scientific of academic work. Uh, we have this tension, uh, Kant made, of, made aware of it, that we want to gain clarity, but at the same time, the only way of doing so is actually if we, not cause, but we, if, if we accept uh, difference, if we accept that things are not clear. And he wrote in his uh, book on, on the pure, uh, in, in the second, uh, ex, uh, second edition, sorry, in the second edition uh, to the critique of pure reason, uh, he wrote something about the presentation. Although, if we are honest, if we are looking at it, it is not really about the presentation as such. And he, he writes, many a book, would have been much clearer if it had not been made quite so clear. For the aids of clarity help in the parts, but often confuse in the whole, since the reader cannot get quickly enough attain a survey of the whole, and all their bright colors paint over and make unrecognizable the articulation or structure of the system which yet matters most when it comes to judging its unity and softness. If we read the entire passage, if we read in the, the entire um, preface, it, it is uh, clear what he means. He, he refers to using examples to clarify things, to make it clearer to the reader uh, by showing this and that way it works, and, and uh, there you can see in with this example uh, what, what I actually mean. But at the same time, we see the detail, but we lose the context. We lose the gaining of the overview. <clears throat> and this is something that again and again and on different levels uh, is bothering us, or should be bothering us. And there is, of course, something that is inherent to methodological limitations uh, that are doomed to, to limit, re, limit ourselves on, on reproduction. Uh, we do not, we simply do not have, or we have difficulties uh, to develop a fundamentally new methodological approach. So we always use the same toolbox. And then, of course, we use the same tools, the methods, uh, to continue our research. And if we want to go back another time to Thomas Kuhn, it is not only the disciplining uh, in terms of approaching reality, but it is within the discipline we have another layer of disciplination. This is currently, whatever this currently means since a couple of years, it is an issue in economics. Actually, I'm going next week uh, to a meeting um, in, in Brussels where we will talk about this. Uh, that it is something where we have, uh, there are different terms used, heterodox economics or pluralism in economics, uh, where colleagues say this mainstream is so reduced on a certain approach that it actually always fails uh, to explain things and to find solutions. <coughs> The Queen of England actually went to the uh, LSE at the time, after just after the beginning of the crisis or 
when it was getting official, where we said or asked, why didn't you find out in advance uh, that there would be a crisis? And the simple answer, which actually took them quite a while to find, was uh, from the academy then, um, we didn't find the answer because we didn't work together. We had been all working our, in, in our little boxes, uh, but we didn't get out of it. We didn't get uh, across uh, the, the disciplines. We, we had been so disciplined that we didn't dare to go to move any further. There is currently, oh, I, I read recently, um, uh, a survey on the productivity of economics, the output uh, of journals. Economics is more and more, is increasingly really an important discipline, is recognized and has something to say, meaning is asked again and again and plays a role in policy making, in, um, of course, financial speculation, uh, in marketing, wherever you go. In terms of the academic discipline, it means that the output is apparently hugely increased. We have a higher productivity of academic work in economics, but at the same time, we have lesser heterogeneity, we have lesser um, pluralism, and we do not have really regional studies. And then, of course, it comes to the question how and to which extent does actually this discipline uh, depend on its own methodology? And how much is it depending on the reality that it is not so much the limitation of the, of, of the uh, discipline, but it is the limitation of reality, meaning we have only one economic policy or policy orientation, and there is no much uh, dispute in reality meaning we have a power imbalance, that only a few people really have the power uh, to define what is going to be done. We have this in different uh, areas, and we saw it, uh, how, how Europe, meaning the institutionalized Europe, had been dealing then um, with countries like Greece, Spain, Ireland, or whatsoever. That was exactly the same in terms of disciplining the countries, asking them to observe, to accept certain limitations to what they would do, and then accepting their um, claims. And this is again more and more the case when we look at uh, what I would call for the moment at, at, at a pure artificial intelligence. It's more and more moved to calculations uh, within a very limited framework that actually can go to computers. They do the stuff, and they're only waiting for the figures to be fed with, and then they move on. <clears throat> if you go to the stock market today, if you go to the international financial market, uh, quite a lot is actually done by algorithms. There is no person shouting and this is what I bid and, and uh, all this. It looks like it still plays a role, but the real work is done by um, algorithms. So it is very much about not explaining what we are actually, what, what we should explain. Utilitarianism <clears throat> is one of the key words of the mainstream economics and still here it fails actually. Looking at itself, it does not ask this question of what is the utility of it? 
What is, wh why are we doing it? What is the purpose of our research? This seems to be something that is already set in stone. Utilitarianism, if we usually refer to it, we refer to individualism um, and the individual's greed or the individual's wants uh, in terms of action and following uh, this idea of uh, looking for utilities, looking for the maximization of utilities. That is what we all do, but it is as well that uh, in this way uh, the societal uh, well-being or welfare is increased because everybody is doing this the same and there is in this average building. <clears throat> uh, of course it is about individuals, um, but at the same time what utilitarianism, utilitarianism really is, um, is getting clear. I found recently, or I was reading an, an article about Coca-Cola and the co-colonialization. Uh, how this enterprise managed really to be an image for capitalism. And in this article I found a sentence where I thought this is remarkable how it makes it clear what um, utilitarianism really is. And it states, devoted employees of the 100 year old company that makes the world a favorite soft drink have always believed, now comes the point, that the human being was created primarily to serve as a con conduit for the dark fizzy beverage. So it is not really about the individual looking for uh, its own or his, his own benefit, but it is something where we are dealing with much more. We are dealing with the utility for the enterprises with the purpose of profit making. That's what we always find again and again and that is something that is not only stated by critical approaches but it is of course stated as well by the capitalists themselves, by the entrepreneurs who say we are there to make profit. Friedman talking about uh, this in terms of, of uh, rejecting any social responsibility. Uh, the enterprise has the aim of making profit. And indeed, it is not uh, wrong at all. But we are talking here about the capitalist enterprise, and then we come to a difference. I've been recently talking with a colleague, with a friend of mine, uh, who is um, from, from the legal area, a jurist. And she said, well, in, in economics it's all very simple. There's a consensus, you don't have any uh, differences in, in what you are interested in, what you are doing, what you are following up. There's only one direction, and that is uh, then only about calculating where you are going. In law, it's different. We have very different approaches in law uh, to, to look at, <clears throat> at, at what, what is the purpose of law, what, is, uh, what, what are we dealing with it. Um, first, of course, I, I rejected this and said, no, uh, listen, there, there are huge differences. Um, and then I thought a little bit later, in a way, she was right. In a way, what she pointed at is, in economics, the class question is openly posed and it is considered to be answered. 
Warren Buffett, he actually admitted and said there's class warfare, all right. But it is my class, the rich class, that's making war and we are winning. It was in 2006 he stated it, it is quoted in the New York Times. And there is this exactly this point where in economics we are dealing with class questions, <clears throat> with the we and the, 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 and the they, and there is not much in between. Of course, there is ideological talk and, and this stuff, but, but it is clear that there are two different classes and that uh, there is no Chetlin Dartua. Uh, it is growth, which is the reference points, a reference point, and, and this is the unit we are talking about only growth. In law, it's a different approach and we are thinking about this vague idea of justice. Is justice about law? Is it about right? Is it a nat natural right? Or what, what is it really uh, that defines justice? And this is a huge difficulty. And of course, there the class question is not asked openly. On the contrary, law has not least a function to hide the class question or to find a compromise when the conflict is too grave. Rudolf von Jering was talking about the, the, the struggle for law, uh, for justice. It's always this conflict and it, it needs permanent uh, solution, moving to a solution. And uh, there is this statement, we often think naively that missing data are the primary impediments to intellectual progress. Just find the right facts and all problems will dissipate. But barriers are often deeper and more abstract in thought. We must have access to the right metaphor, not only to the requisite information. Revolutionary thinkers are not primarily gatherers of facts, but weavers of new intellectual structures. This is taken from a book, uh, The Flamingo Style, uh, Smile, sorry, uh, written by Stephen J. Gold, uh, actually dealing with natural history of natural science. I think it is an interesting point that is made and that uh, clearly is the disciplination of economics as well. Think about data, think about information, and that's the main point, and then you have it all. The free market is free market because everybody has full information. That's a precondition of the entire thinking of economics. And this is where uh, we are actually looking at um, economists going back to the old a state of um, hunters and gatherers. They are looking for information, they are looking for markets, they are looking for something that is uh, has to be exchanged and not anything more. If this is sufficient, if one is happy with it, of course one can be. At the same time, there is a fundamental lack today in mainstream economics in terms of looking for this unity, in terms of looking for the whole. What I, or, or the, the reason for, uh, for, for quoting Kant. And now we reach at this point where we have to acknowledge, and this is true not only for economics, it cannot be neutral. Science is always 
based on partisanship is always following interests. Disciplination, the drawing of borders follows certain interests. It's not a neutral thing. Even between what is called social science and science, the border is not entirely arbitrary, but it is definitely not neutral. This means as well that there is no universality of science. There is no universal universality of rights, there is no universality of uh, knowledge. It always, and this is uh, the third point, it always is linked to social action and with this, fourthly, to historical situation, situations, developments, structures. How to get from here to this point of acknowledging unity, acknowledging this wider field and not limiting ourselves in terms of methodology. <clears throat> Fitch was looking at poetry so an entirely different way and not really a science as such. We have science looking at poetry, but poetry as such is, uh, if, if one wants, even an, an anti-science. Uh, he says poetry is um, a utility providing unity. And this is the point where the thinness of knowledge, when divorced from human effect and experience, is illustrated in the increasing tendency to associate <clears throat> knowledge with information, to reduce it on information, and typically information of a kind that can be translated into machine language. And there we come to this point where it is really uh, problematic, hugely problematic, when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is not bad as such, but artificial intelligence requires us programming these machines to actually reduce knowledge to reduce units, unity, on small little units that are combined in different ways. So we adapt our thinking to the requirements of the machine, to the requirement uh, of, of uh, a machine that can look at uh, or provide uh, us with tools to combine and recombine things. I always one may agree with it or not, recommend my students, you have to read textbooks, of course. You have to get this basic knowledge. But always read novels, read biographies, and look at the difference, at the entirety of what is the reality behind it. And Marx formulated it in this way, often quoted, the concrete is concrete because it is the concentration of many determinations. Hence, unity of diverse. This small little concrete thing, this is entailing the entire di di diversity, the entire universe. It appears in the process of thinking, therefore, as a process of concentration, as a result, not as the point of departure, even though it is the point of departure in reality and hence also in the point, uh, the, the point of departure 
for observation, the unshown and the point of departure of the conception. This is the difference between the hunter and gatherer looking for information, following the small little disciplines that are required, and the player, the gamer, referring here to the uh, Letters upon the Aesthetic Education by Schinner, where he says, man only plays when in the full meaning of the word he is a man. And he is only completely a man when he plays. And of course, on the 9th of March, I have to say, man is not man, but it is a human being. So that it, it, it is this complexity where we have to know exactly the laws, but at the same time where we have to be sovereign and being able to play with it. Talking about knowledge and the development of knowledge in terms of research, in terms of teaching, in terms of learning. I think we should think as well about knowledge as something that is and cannot be a commodity. Knowledge is not there to be sold. It is not there to be bought. Of course, it means that there are material resources needed. But at the same time, the use of knowledge is increasing its value, different to any other community. You cannot eat the cake and have it. You have to decide there. You can have knowledge and make use of the knowledge and you maintain it. Actually, the second point is if you use it, and if you use it in a collective way, in a social way, it is actually increasing uh, its value. It is increasing as well what we can do with it. Something to think about, I would say. And it is all about curiosity. Take care. Ciao.